Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be looking at a specific zone in the posterior neck called the suboccipital region. And the suboccipital region is composed of really four muscles that we're going to see right here. There's a left and right for each of these. We're only going to look at the right side for simplicity. And then also an important nerve and a blood vessel that lies uh, within the space right here. And we'll go into more detail with that as we go throughout the video. So first of all, why is this region called the suboccipital region? Well, if we look here in this image, we have here the back or posterior aspect of the skull. This cranial bone right here is, of course, the occipital bone. And so all of these structures pretty much lie beneath the occiput or occipital bone, so they are considered suboccipital. Um, another piece of information that is useful is that all of these structures are deep to the splenius muscles. Recall that in the videos over the deep muscles of the back and the neck, we covered the splenius muscles, uh, and specifically the splenius capitis and splenius cervicus. And it turns out that all these muscles in the suboccipital region, all these structures, are going to be deep to the splenius capitis. So you would not be able to palpate these or see these without actually pulling off all the superficial muscles, which would include the trapezius and then the splenius capitis and possibly splenius cervicus, okay? Also notice that beneath the occipital bone right here, we have the C1 vertebra, which is our atlas, and beneath that we have the C2 vertebra, which is the axis. And the reason I mention that is we're going to see in a few minutes that several of these muscles are going to have origins and insertions on the atlas and the axis. And then some of them will have insertions on the occiput. All right, so what are the components of the suboccipital region? Well, first we have the suboccipital triangle. I'm going to switch over to this slide because here I actually have the triangle traced out. And notice that out of the four muscles here, uh, only three of them actually comprise the triangle. This medial muscle right here does not. So the suboccipital triangle is composed of three muscles. The first is this long muscle right here. Uh, this is actually what's called the rectus capitis posterior major, long name. And if we actually look at the this picture, we can actually deduce what the origins and insertions are. Okay? And for all of these, the origins are inferior and the insertions are superior. So if we look at this muscle, rectus capitis posterior major, we actually can see its origin. Its origin is on the spinous process of the axis, or C2. We notice that it extends upwards, and it's just going to insert on the occiput. Okay? And uh, again, all of these muscles, they have a counterpart on the left side, so they're bilateral muscles. Okay? And the action of the rectus capitis posterior major, if both of them contract, both left and right muscles, we get neck extension. It's going to assist in that. And then if one of these contracts, we get ipsilateral rotation of the neck. So for example, if the right rectus capitis posterior major contracts without the left, then we get rotation of the neck to the right. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, then this muscle right here, this one is what's called the obliquus capitis superior. Okay? Uh, the obliquus capitis superior we see is going to originate on the transverse process of C1, the atlas. Okay? And then it's also going to insert on the occiput. Okay? Uh, recall from some of the previous videos that if we have capitis in the name of a muscle, that implies that it's going to insert somewhere on the skull, usually the occiput. The one exception to that is actually going to be the next muscle, but we'll cover that in a minute. With the obliquus capitis superior, its action is going to be, if both of them contract, left and right, we're going to get neck extension. So this is going to assist with the rectus capitis posterior major and then the major neck extensors like the splenius uh, capitis. And then if one of these muscles, one obliquus capitis superior contracts, we get lateral flexion or ipsilateral lateral flexion. So in other words, if this, the right obliquus capitis superior contracts without the left, then we'd get lateral flexion of the neck to the right, okay? Now the third muscle that comprises the suboccipital triangle is the obliquus capitis inferior. As I mentioned a minute ago, its name is somewhat of a misnomer because it neither originates nor inserts on the occiput. But again, we're just going to keep the name kind of consistent. Okay, so it's obliquus capitis inferior. We can see that it originates on the spinous process of C2, the axis, and if we follow the fibers upward, it's going to insert 
on the transverse process of C1. Now again, it's a bilateral muscle, so if both of them contract at the same time, then we get neck extension, so it's going to assist in that. If one of them contracts, then we're going to get ipsilateral rotation of the neck. So if the right obliquus capitis inferior contracts without the left, we get rotation of the neck to the right. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So these three muscles right here are what comprise the suboccipital triangle. Uh, note that this muscle over here uh, is not part of the triangle, but it is a suboccipital muscle. It's actually called the rectus capitis posterior minor, but we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. What we want to talk about now are some other structures that are contained within the suboccipital triangle. And those are the vertebral artery and the suboccipital nerve. Okay, so first of all, I, have, I don't have them shown here, but recall that the vertebral artery is an artery that ascends upward from the subclavian artery. So remember, the subclavian artery is sort of in the clavicular region, where your clavicle is, and it ascends upward through C6, that is the transverse foramen of C6, up through that of C5, C4, C3, and then up through the transverse foramen of C2, and then it'll have to move through this triangle up to the transverse foramen of C1, and then it'll basically move up uh, toward the skull. And eventually, the right vertebral artery will fuse with the left vertebral artery and become the basilar artery, which actually that occurs inside the skull, uh, sort of in the brain region, so to speak. Okay? But within the suboccipital triangle, we're going to see a component of the vertebral artery as it's ascending upward. Okay. The other structure that we're going to see inside the suboccipital triangle is the suboccipital nerve. Okay? Um, it's important to note that the suboccipital nerve is actually the nervous supply um, to all four of these muscles, okay? um, including the rectus capitis posterior minor. So the suboccipital nerve runs through here and it supplies uh, innervation to all four of these muscles. Also, the blood supply to all four of these muscles comes from branches of the vertebral artery. Okay. Now the final component here to the suboccipital region is this muscle right here, which is the rectus capitis posterior minor. Now again, I'm treating this separately because it's not actually part of the suboccipital triangle. It's actually out to the side, although it shares the same blood supply and nervous supply as all the other three. So if we look at the rectus capitis posterior minor, we can see its origin down here. But recall that the atlas does not actually have a spinous process. It actually has a posterior tubercle. Okay? And so the origin of this muscle is actually just lateral to the posterior tubercle of C1. In some cases, you might actually see it as the posterior arch. But it's just lateral to the posterior tubercle. Okay? And then it's going to insert on the occiput. Now, if we have both muscles bilaterally contract, so left and right, then we're going to get neck extension. Okay? Now, the contribution of this muscle to neck extension is very, very minor. And I want to make a point here. When we're talking about neck extension, it's important to realize that the major neck extensors are really going to be uh, some of the uh, capitus muscles of the erector spiny muscle group, and then also the splenius muscles like the splenius capitus and splenius cervicus. And even the trapezius, upper fibers, actually have some role in, in neck extension. Okay? These muscles, all of them, are really just assisters in neck extension, and by far the weakest in terms of the neck extension department is the rectus capitus posterior minor. In fact, the neck extension power of this muscle is so weak that it's often thought that it's more of a proprioceptive muscle or a sensory muscle than actually providing any neck extension. Okay? Uh, but uh, for the most part, we just say it's a neck extensor, but just understand that it's very weak. Okay? So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the parts of the suboccipital region. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.